Welcome to the Reticle Up Podcast, where I, Three Gun Kenzie, will be interviewing competitive shooters, hunters, fishermen, archers, entrepreneurs, and outdoorsmen. Come learn with me as I interview people from all walks of life, in different disciplines, all across the world, from novices to professionals of all ages. No matter what, everyone has something they can teach you. So come join me on the journey. The Reticle Up podcast is produced in partnership with AmericanFirearms.org. American Firearms mission is to recommend what works. We believe everyone deserves access to unbiased, helpful information about firearms. And our buying guides, product reviews, and learning resources are designed to help real people find the stuff that will work best for them. Check us out at www.americanfirearms.org. Welcome back, friends, to the Reticle Up podcast. I am joined by Caleb Giddings. So he's the brand manager. Whoops, I've already messed it up. <laughs> That's going to be we, great. We went through this before you started recording. Brand <laughs> okay, marketing we're manager. This That's what it says on my business card. Sure, sure. So anyways, but also Revolver extraordinaire. So he's actually, if you're going to watch this on video on YouTube, going to give us a demo on strong hand and weak hand loading with a revolver, um, which is something I want to learn how to do. So Caleb, thanks for joining. Yeah, it's uh, good to be here. We've tried to do this, what, four times now? And then you were sick. I was sick. We were busy. We both are sick. <laughs> we're, and, and the best part is we're, we're doing it now, and we're still both sick from SHOT Show. So, you know, that's that's fantastic. It's great. It's great. Everyone's like, ooh, SHOT Show must be so cool. What's it like? And I'm like, imagine swimming in someone's dirty dishwater for five days. It was seven for me. Right. So... I don't even remember when I got there because I came from, I was in Miami. Yeah. And so I left, I left my house on Friday of fucking whenever. And then I'm leaving again in a couple of days because you guys want to get a a cool job in the gut. Like, please make no mistake. I love my job and I've been working in the firearm industry for a long time now, but also sometimes it's exhausting. Yes. It's actually always exhausting, but love our lives. Hashtag no complaints. Anyways. Hashtag no complaints. Hashtag. (laughs) Fuck you pay me. I mean, wait, what? <laughs> this is great. Um, I want to go back to your olden days since you're so much older than me and talk about <laughs> top shot. I know, right? Um, so Kayla, back up and talk about like why you got started in like shooting sports, how you got on top shot. Did you apply? Did you like I don't know anything about that show, right? So oh, Lord. tell me your um, history there. So sh- why I got started in the shooting sports, uh that's a good question. I so in 08, um, I had started, right? So if you're old like me, you remember blogs, right? So uh, in 2006, I started writing a blog about guns because I liked guns and I wanted to write about them. And little did I know that at the time I knew absolutely nothing. Like I had no idea what I was talking about. And I'm really glad that a lot of the content I created from that time has not survived and it's nowhere to be found on the internet because I was stupid as hell. Hmm. You're not going to find it. I see you Googling. You're not going to find it. Um, So I started writing uh, in 06. I got my first paid gig in like 2007. In 2008, I won a contest that was put on by Michael Bain. So Michael was always very forward thinking when it came to, has always been forward thinking when it comes to content creation and stuff like that. So he basically put together a contest for gun right, gun bloggers, people who were primarily writing blogs about guns. And he took the 10 most popular and took us to what was at the time called Blackwater. Again, there's a dated reference. Um, And we did this whole Fandango that was hosted by Blackwater, Crimson Trace, um, Black Hawk holsters, and we basically took a three-day training class from Todd Jarrett um, and learned how to shoot like 1911s. Oh yeah, because it was sponsored by Para USA, which is another company oh, that like not even existence. You have to be old. I no, I think they still technically exist, but hang don't on, Google that. Para USA. <laughs> uh, the seeing as the first Google nope. result is their Wikipedia page. Oh, and it's oh uh, sad face. Para USA was an American-owned firearms manufacturer. <laughs> so anyway, Para was one of the sponsors, and we took this class from Todd Jarrett, and you know it was fantastic. Todd uh, is a great instructor, and that was what kind of made me. Uh, I think I'd probably shot a couple of like IDPA matches here or there before that, but that was what really got me interested in it. Hmm. Started shooting more and more. Um, did a bunch of stuff. Uh, 
fast forward, it's like 2000, it's like late 2009. I kept in touch with Michael Bain because he kept giving me paying work. So I was like, cool. Uh, and he sends me a thing about this TV show. And he's like, Hey, I know some of the producers who are doing the show. It's going to be like survivor with guns. It's going to be on a big network. You're good on camera. You should apply. I was like, Oh yeah. So I put in an application and I had no expectation whatsoever of getting picked. They picked me for the initial interviews. They flew myself along with all the other people who got picked to Los Angeles. Uh, and when I'm at in these like waiting rooms of like people, uh, for this audition, I'm looking around the waiting, and this was the first season. So, like, this was like a very much had never been done before kind of situation. And I'm looking around like other people waiting to go in for their interviews. And there, Dave Savigny was there. Um, if you guys, and again, for you youths out there, you might not actually know who Dave Savigny is. But I knew he came back though. He's kind of like made like a a small comeback. Yeah, yeah. Well, he had a lot of surgery and like a lot of other stuff. But to in 2010. Fair. To be fair, I did meet him and I had no clue who he was. And do you know who that is? And uh, people are people. I will say that across the board. People are people. But I'm like, oh, cool. <laughs> really so to put about, it like, in perspective, no so for the youths, if you don't know who Dave Savigny is, especially 2010 Dave Savigny, he was literally the best handgun shooter on the planet. Like it was either him or Vogel. And they were back and forth beating each other up with Glocks. And it was just, and they were at the absolute pinnacle of the game, right? Other people that were there for the interviews, James Yeager, uh, RIP homie, um, Jerry Michalek, uh, did like a lot of like really top tier shooters and personalities and stuff were there. So I was like, there's no fucking way they're going to pick me out of this. <laughs> that like, no way, right. no friggin' way. Right. And then they needed somebody for everybody to meet. So they're like, Caleb. Well, fun story about that and things that I learned in the aftermath of reality. I learned a lot about yeah. reality TV and how they make the sausage. Um, and so fast forward, they ended up picking me for the show. I had to fly out to California for like, I want to say I was out there for like three weeks, two or three weeks. Um, and, you know, what they had done was they had picked a really broad variety of skill sets for the show and what i learned later is they don't just pick you based for your skill set they pick you based on whether or not they think you might create conflict with someone else or if someone might create conflict with you because what they're trying to do is pick people that make good television and so what i say to anyone who has watched any reality show ever whether it's survivor or top shot or you know any of the mainstream productions <laughs> those shows have editors Who knew? and they have editors for a reason they also have writers and it's not that the show is scripted but what a writer can do is he looks at the footage and he goes all right well if we put this here even though it happened here it will make this look more dramatic. So we just do a little, a little, little cut and paste, and then <laughs> things happen the way that they want them to happen. Yep. So, you know, and I'm not saying that they like. It's funny because it's not like they're actually outright lying, right? They're just massaging the narrative a little bit to make better television out of it. So always, whenever you're watching any reality TV show, bear that in mind. Yep. But you know, with Top Shot, it was so unique. Uh, it was such a such an unheard of thing that those of us that were smart and willing to be aggressive were able to take it and turn it. You know, I was a, a an insurance agent at the time, right? And I was able to take my uh, exposure. It's the only time exposure has actually been good for anyone ever. Right? <clears throat> Pay you an exposure. Yeah. Anyway, it was the. Yeah, it was the only time I was ever able to take my exposure and actually turn it into money. But I should note that not that money never came from the History Channel. It was me being willing to capitalize on my face and my notoriety uh, to go out and get paid writing jobs, paid you know talking sure, jobs. And sure, stuff wasn't like your that. voice and not your face. <laughs> You know what's funny is the voice is definitely not part of the package, especially right now because I sound like a like a mildly stoned Kermit the Frog because of the cold <laughs> that you gave me. <laughs> no, yeah. So Top Shot was cool, though. I mean, we're never going to see the likes of that ever again on television. Period. No. Um, but it, it there, have been, launch... there have been attempts too. I know, and and it did launch a lot of careers, though. I mean, people don't realize the people that like like you said kind of capitalize on it or people were able to follow them on instagram there was no shadow banning there was easy to find these people and follow them and oh, blah yeah. blah blah but then yeah. a lot of platforms which are still relevant today 
you yeah, know? I I forgot about the whole no shadow banning thing. Cause when Top Shot came out, like I was just on Facebook yeah. and I didn't have like a fan page or anything like that. And then the next thing I know, I had like 4,000 friend requests and I'm like, Oh dear God, I cannot yeah. manage all of this. So I ended up, uh, having to create that was when I created a fan page and all of that other stuff. So, and yeah. now, you know, it's a completely different story. I know, I know. I know, so I know. no, it's, it is what it is though, but that is cool. I mean, I'm jealous of that era for sure. Um, mm -hmm. it, was, that, that it was, it was the wild west. It was the wild west. Yeah. We, and so we've talked about this. So, hmm, okay. So for the writing, for working for yourself, for creating content, it's not easy. It's a lot of work and a lot of effort. And honestly, with, Things being shadow banned, like right now, like as we're speaking, you know, people are getting stuff removed from YouTube and you can't find them on Instagram without typing their full username or what have you, that there's still value in the written word, mm -hmm. right? There's still value in having a website with a blog where people can read up and watch content, with, not on YouTube, but why do you think that's still important to, to have those, those writers and stuff? Well, it's the same reason that email marketing is always going to be relevant for the yep. firearm space. Uh, even if it's no longer relevant for like mainstream consumer stuff is because we're a siloed industry and because we're a heavily regulated industry, like in terms of actual real world regulation. And, you know, there's, we're also a social gray area industry for lack of a better term mm -hmm. in that I think as you see increasing pressure on, you know, your Facebooks and your Instagrams and your YouTubes to push firearms related content further and further out of the limelight, we're actually going to, revert to a more 2010 2012 space where your content leaders and your thought leaders are going to be on forums on their own platforms on things like that i mean it's you know look at it's why you know a website like air 15 everyone has been predicting the downfall of air 15.com ever since it first stood up but arfcom's never going away because it is almost a secondary Facebook in terms of its level of user base and popularity. And when Facebook eventually finally says, you know what, F all these gun people, we're getting rid of all gun content forever. We're still going to have our ARFCOMs and our pistol forums and, you know, people's websites and stuff like that. So I think that there is, there's always going to be a space for that, especially in this community which means that there's always going to be a space for people who are good at creating ideas and taking ideas and translating them into the written word. Yeah. Yeah. That's well said. Um, so did you ever think that you would be end up or end up being a writer and creating content or did that fall into your lap? That it sort of fell into my lap on accident. Um, and then I kept getting better at it. And so I kept doing it. People kept paying me and then I kept doing it more and more. And then it kept paying me. And so I kept doing it. And then it was a job. And I'm like, when the fuck? Uh, but it was, it was interesting because I had, I was very fortunate in my writing career. I had some very good mentors, you know, obviously Michael Bain took me under his wing at an early age, gave me some very sage advice. Uh, a guy named Richard Mann, who a lot of these goddamn kids don't probably don't know who Richard don't is. Know. Yep. Richard Mann was an early mentor of mine. He made some very important introductions for me that got my feet in to a lot of different places in the writing space. And then you know, I, I kept content and I kept making good content. I did a lot on my own, you know, um, what really solidified my game as a writer in terms of finding my voice and getting good at actually writing was for, let me think about the time frame from 2011 until 2015. So 20, so about from the end of Top Shot until uh, I went back into the military in 2015, I wrote three posts a day, five days a week, a minimum of a thousand word, a minimum of 300 words per post. Mm -hmm. So that's like a thousand words per day, five days a week for what, 2011, 12, 13, 14, five years. What does that work out to in terms of words? I don't know. Let's do some math on this. On your <laughs> I'm podcast. like, I'm not. I know, I'm right? Not People are like, I'm not here to work. <laughs> You're like, I'm not here to do work. It's a uh, great question, Caleb. So for some reason, the calculator app on my laptop's not opening. That's fun. All right. So let's say we wrote 900 words a day, give or take, times five days a week, times five years. That's not right. That's times. Not right. No, times 52 days. weeks in a year. Yeah. 900 times five times 
52 times five. So that's like a million words and change, right? Over the course of five years. And that, that was my, everyone's heard of the 10,000 hours. That was my 10,000 hours in writing was I put that in and, you know, uh, it's, it's so much easier now than it used to be to get better at writing because we have all these tools like, uh, Grammarly. Yeah. Grammarly. Yeah. Stuff like that, where you can like put it in and like, Oh, here's the first uh, paid article that I ever sent in got rejected for having too much passive voice in it. (laughs) Uh, Fast forward many, many years later, that guy sent me a submission because I was the editor for tactical life. And I was like, Oh, petty, but rejected. Um, (laughs) Holy shit. (laughs) I mean, I didn't do that. That would be childish and immature. (laughs) Not me. Never. No, but yeah, it's one of those things where, and it, there's still there's still loads there's still loads and loads of opportunities for people. If you want to be a yeah. gun writer, there's still plenty of opportunities because the internet is a never ending gaping maw that you will just pour content into forever and ever and ever, and it will never be satisfied. I've written variations of the same article multiple times because there is always a demand for how to get started in XYZ shooting sport. Yeah. Yeah. If you Google certain things like how to shoot a GSF match, <laughs> it's really funny. That was the first thing I got started in. Yeah. Your girl's article is on page one of Google, but it's really funny because there's constantly, seriously, people sending me screenshots, whether they're friends or people that follow me on Instagram, they're like, yeah, I was Googling for this chassis or I was Googling for this. And then what pops up is this article and I'm reading it. I'm like, who wrote this? You did. <laughs> I'm like, well, I, I just did that the other day. I was looking for like a area six results or something. Right, and you had written an article about it. And I was like, first off, who freaking paid you to write an article about an area match? <laughs> You're welcome. USPSA. I uh, cover all the major matches and interview the shooters that win their divisions, take photos. I also take photos of all of the shooters that I can when I'm not shooting and upload them to Dropbox. So for free, I'm adding value for the, the shooters. But like the writing side... Shooting USA will pick up the bigger articles and share them because the print stuff, you know, it's for uh, subscription for USPSA. Mm-hmm. But when they pick up the bigger ones, it's nice to get that online digital stuff. That's again, you've seen it. My buddies have seen it. It's just happened a lot, and I'm like, he, it's cool. Just out here, out here making content. That's cool. Um, it is. I don't think it's dead, and that's where even print stuff. It I don't. I still find value in it. I still have magazines sent to the house. I still read them. I like them, but. Well, and that's the interesting thing. They're, you know, they've also been predicting the death of print and stuff like that. Forever. And while print is going to shrink, and you know, and it, it print has shrunk, and you've seen a drawdown in you know subscriber numbers and stuff like that in print. Print will never fully go away. Yeah. You will always have a certain number of people who want that print magazine and that sort of stuff. And what the shrinking of print has done is it's eliminated some of the lower quality print publications like (laughs) if you want to survive as a print magazine you need to be making good content which is also true if you want to survive as a website you need to be making well maybe not good content but you need to be making content that people want to interact with yeah yeah so okay we've digressed but going back we have it these are subjects that that you know these are things that people find interesting yes but we were on a timeline that i was trying to not mess up here was when did the revolver life enter the Caleb and then go to the USPSA and then all of that. Uh, so I, uh, I'd always liked revolvers, right? Like I'd always kind of had a soft spot for them. Uh, I think that was because when I was a kid, my dad was a cop. He initially carried a revolver and then somewhere in this house, I have like a giant coffee table book, like full of like old revolver pictures, like the spines worn off it. I've read it cover to cover when I was a child, um, <laughs> stuff like that. <clears throat> but the, uh, what happened? You, you see what happened was so I was uh, 2011. I was reviewing the at that time brand new Springfield XDM 525 competition, right? Which mm-hmm. I still think is a pretty good gun. Um, the as as an aside, the space that that gun occupied for production guns has changed so much due to USPSA rule changes over the few years that it's not really the best choice for that anymore. <laughs> but still a good gun. Um, so I was reviewing that. I shot it at Steel Challenge. I had done okay. The last Steel Challenge match in California, RIP. Um, sport hasn't been the same since then. And 
Uh, I shot it at that. And then I took it to the inaugural IDPA World Championship and I got the shit kicked out of me. Like I lost big time, right? And I was I was a pretty good shooter, but I was able to realize that why I had lost had a lot to do with my visual discipline and my trigger discipline were not meeting each other. You mean visual patience? visual patience visual discipline you know whatever okay, okay. Same, same terms <laughs> um so my they weren't meeting where i needed them to meet and i was dropping too many points right and i was like how can i force myself to have the visual patience uh to go with the trigger discipline that i need to be more successful at this and at the time the way idpa's rules were set up was uh, you couldn't have more than six shots in a position and you still in IDPA can't have more than 18 shots per stage. Right. right? So I'm like, well, I'll shoot a revolver. I only have 18 rounds like on my body. <laughs> so I can't afford to fucking miss anywhere. Yeah. And so I started doing that and I liked it. And so then I kept doing that and I continued to like it. And by and large now for the last but frick 12 years, I have primarily shot revolver. There's been detours here and there, and the detours that I've taken out of revolver were always when I was getting paid to do something right. else, right? So yeah. I got paid by Colt to shoot 1911s, which was great fun, That's pretty by cool. the way. Yeah. Uh, I got paid by Beretta to shoot the PX4 Storm for a while, which was a uh, great experience. It's a great gun that never got the love it deserved. Um, you know, stuff like that. So I've had like deviations where I've been getting paid to do something else or you know, for a specific thing, I would use a Beretta M9 because that was the gun that I was issued by the Air Force at the time. But yeah, for the most part, for the last 12 years, it's pretty much been all revolver. Since then, uh, I have done, <clears throat> I've done IDPA revolver. I've done USPSA revolver. I've done a lot of steel challenge revolver, which What are your is, classifications and all those? So IDPA uh, masterclass uh, i Corps, which is the International Confederation of Revolver Enthusiasts, uh, I'm in, I'm a, a master in classic division, which is your six shot, like speed loader, fed gun. Um, that was so f hard to do. <laughs> I-Core is, i -Core is, okay. So the i -Core classification system works like USPSAs where like a hundred percent is, you know, 95 to a hundred is GM. Mm -hmm. Um, and then 90 or like whatever, 85 to 95. 94 is master. But the scoring system in I-Core is time plus, like IDPA. So if I miss the A zone and I hit yeah. a B, it's plus one second. Mm -hmm. Fucking, that's insane. So not only do you have to aim your ass off, but you got to do it really, really fast. I, making I-Core master was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Um, so master and I-Core, uh, only B class in USPSA revolver. And that's mostly because I have got... I think I've only got like six classifiers on file for USPSA because I don't shoot. Yeah, I don't shoot a lot of USPSA revolver. I'm actually looking at my classification right now because uh, I don't. No, I know it. I oh shit, I typed in the wrong number. And steel challenge. You're right. Steel challenge. Uh, a class in iron sight revolver. I was, a f I was not far off of um getting my M. Fuck right off yelling at my computer people are gonna love this podcast. this podcast it is we are already three quarters of the way off the rails and i'm headed for headed for the ditch yeah so uspsa revolver my classification is terrible i had some bad luck too where i had a couple of classifiers so if you look at my record there was a classifier i shot in 2020 and 2021 there's a 47 and that 47 was how i found out that the gun i was shooting at the time would uh uh, the 150 grain Syntec rounds would tumble so they wouldn't shoot straight. So I shot a run that would have been like an 80 something. And then I had two bullets go sideways through the hard cover of the Ooh. target. So I'm like, Ooh, Mike, Mike. I'm like, well, so Aww. much for that cool guy run. Do to do. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, the last time. So yeah, here's my USPSA classifiers. I have one in 2010, one in 2011, one in 2012, then nothing from 2012 until 2020 then i have one in 2020 one in 2021 and one in 2022 okay. at some point i i i'm gonna go back and fix that and go pick up my m card but the problem is and this is not well so this isn't a knock on uspsa per se but 
uh, cause I'm a huge believer in people shooting competition. My primary focus in the industry at this point is on defensive applications for handgunning, right? Yeah. For people who are carrying these guns for personal protection. And I love USPSA, but the revolver division of USPSA is very far removed from what people, from the guns that people are actually carrying and how they're actually using them. Sure. I know a lot of people who carry revolvers and I don't know nobody who's carrying a six inch eight shot moon clip <laughs> nine mil. Right. Like I just, and I'm sure that that guy's going to send me an email and I'm like, well, I am. So you're wrong. <laughs> okay. Congratulations, dude. But the USPSA isn't particularly relevant. If you are interested in the defensive application of a revolver, USPSA is not particularly relevant. So I sure. haven't really prioritized it. But that being said, before I took the job that I'm in right now with uh, Taurus, I was very aggressively trying to climb up and get that master card in steel challenge um i was i don't know i really like steel challenge so i got let's see where did i get isr yeah i was 13 seconds off of master in isr and i can cut all of that basically out of like two stages so if i hadn't taken this job i would probably still be trying to grind that trying one down. That. Yeah. yeah so yeah. Now, the moment we've all been waiting for here like let's see this strong hand and weekend loading technique okay. and like in to explain it slow mo style, and then let's see how fast you can do it. So Go. broadly, so <laughs> my specialty has been for the longest time the six shot speed loader fed revolver. Right, uh, I've were I've done a lot of shooting with some with moon clip guns and stuff like that. But when I first started shooting revolvers, I had no formal instruction in them, right? I, there was no, there were no, like all of the revolver guys back then were either dead or they didn't know how to make YouTube videos. So none of this stuff was out there. Mm -hmm. So I had to go and I had to figure out a lot of it for myself. And I figured out a grip that's different from the traditional revolver grip. And I figured out my reload uh, which was different from how most, uh, well, from how a lot of people reloaded the gun, which is a lot of people reload the gun using what, you know, I refer to as the Michelek reload, where the gun switches hands and you end up holding it in your support hand and grabbing your spare ammo with your dominant hand and feeding it into the gun that way. And I do a reload that I refer to as a weak hand reload, where I end up grabbing my spare ammo with my support hand, just like I would if I was reloading a pistol mag or a rifle mag or something yeah. like that. So how those work, and we're going to demo this, and I'm going to wave a real gun around here, but it's not a loaded gun. So for the people that are watching the video, I'm actually showing you guys an empty gun. Um, and these are orange dummy, orange tipped dummy rounds, so I don't have any of that. So how this would work, it, there's... There's like a million ways to skin a cat, right? And there's also a million ways to reload this gun, depending on how you a interact. Million? I feel like that's five. Yeah. D you're, you start to get a lot of variations in how you open the cylinder, how you get the empties out of the gun, right? So I'll go through the three most common reloads, starting with the Michelek reload. So with the Michelek reload for a right-handed shooter... Hang on, I'm like put my thumbs like Jerry does because Jerry and I hold the gun differently. Um, so for a right-handed shooter, how you initiate your reload with a Michelin style reload is your strong hand thumb pushes the cylinder release and your strong hand index finger pushes the cylinder out of the frame, right? Then you're going to swap the gun into your support hand with your thumb going over the ejector rod and your index finger and middle finger going through the cylinder window on top of the cylinder to stabilize it. While you're doing that, your strong hand is making a beeline for your spare ammunition, which is usually going to be located forward of your holster on your strong side. Okay. So it's going to basically straight down from where my strong hand is. My thumb will articulate the ejector rod. So my thumb is just going to push that ejector rod and that is hopefully going to get all of the empties out of my gun at once i do that i'm going to rotate the gun straight down it's going to move closer to my waistline i'm not going to do that on camera because that would drop it out of the shot yeah. unless you want me to stand up and show, show my crotch to the camera but I mean. no so we're not going to do that people don't want to look at my crotch they want to look at my pretty face uh so we're going to drop the gun down to our waistline, orienting the muzzle down, at which point my strong hand with my rounds is going to line those rounds up with the cylinder. Depending on the type of loading device I'm going to use, we're going to either push the rounds in, or we're going to push and twist, or we're just going to drop if it's a moon clip. So with this, I just push them in, because I'm using a Safari Lane Comp 3, 
it releases the rounds. I would just let that fall away because the next thing I'm going to do is using my uh, support hand thumb, I'm going to push the cylinder closed. I'm going to rotate my dominant hand around and reestablish my master grip and go back to making loud noises. That's pretty cool. Making loud noises. <laughs> it's a lot is what it is. So a couple of notes on that reload is it works best with moon clip guns because if I'm just using my thumb to hit the, the ejector, a moon clip gun links all six rounds all together, together, so they should all come out together. If I'm using loose rounds like a speed loader fed gun, they might not all want to come out together, which is why the second variation of this reload is commonly referred to as the stress fire reload. It's taught by a lot. It's, it's a more defensive oriented one because it's more positive. Everything is basically the same except for getting the cylinder out of the window and how I articulate the ejector. So in that one, when I press the cylinder release with my, uh, when I press the cylinder release with my dominant thumb, I'm going to use these two fingers on my support hand to push that cylinder out of the window. Then once I grab that gun, I'm going to hold it vertically straight up and down. And I'm going to use my dominant hand to push the ejector rod down to make sure that any sort of straight, any sort of round or anything is going to fall all the way clear of it. Then like the rest in the rest of the reload, I'm going to point the gun muzzle okay. down, grab my rounds, put them in. That's commonly referred to as the stress fire reload. And again, it's very positive. It was very popular with law enforcement when all law enforcement was carrying were six shot, you know, 357, 38 special revolvers. And it's also not what I do because I got to be different. So what I do is Caleb I, what this is called the Caleb Giddings. <laughs> no, I know there's other guys who reload using a variation of this. I don't claim to, I definitely don't claim to have invented this because if you go back and watch, um, Magnum Force, the second Dirty Harry movie. Uh, there's a guy who reloads exactly like this in there, and he was very clearly trained to do that reload by someone who did it at a high level. Nice. Uh, so what I do is I start the reload off very similar to everything else, right? Strong hand thumb activates the cylinder release, support hand, um, index finger, and middle finger push the cylinder out of the window. Then instead of switching hands, I leave my strong hand on the gun. I point the muzzle up usually at about a 45 degree angle. If I'm using like a snub nose gun, I'm going to go straight up and down. But on my competition revolver, about a 45 is good enough. And my support hand articulates the ejector rod. Okay. So my support hand hits this ejector rod. All of the naughty empties come out. And then simultaneously, I'm going to race the gun down to my waistline, pointing the muzzle down as my support hand grabs my speed loader. Once my speed loader is in my hand and the gun is pointed down, I'm going to align those cartridges and I'm going to push, release the rounds. Once that's done, we close the cylinder and I bring the gun back up and get it up on target. Uh, yeah, pretty much how I've been doing it for that weekend reload is how I've been doing it for a long time now. I am consistent using IDPA concealment in match conditions under three seconds. Jesus Christ which is with the, the kind of the math that I've worked out on this over the years is a really good concealment, like IDPA style reload using a semi-automatic pistol is anything under two. And like the fastest that I've hit in practice with like a ID with a semi-auto using IDPA style consistent uh, concealment was I hit like a, I hit like a one five once mm -hmm. and I've hit two fives with the speed loader gun but it's not something that like if you're like caleb do a two five reload yeah. right now i would be like yeah okay we're gonna we're gonna try but pretty consistently i'm right in that three in that you know two nine to three two area is yeah. where that window is okay so now i want to go over you said safari land something something <laughs> like what? right so let's talk about gear, gear um, thank you. <laughs> so one of the disadvantages to the way that i reload one of the disadvantages to the way that i reload the gun it is not gear agnostic which means you have to use either moon clips or a specific type of speed loader and the specific type of speed loader that you have to use is what's called a direct injection so it is either a safari land comp three so the comp three is spring loaded if you're hang on you do this. I try not to launch these dummy rounds. There we go. So the comp three is spring loaded. If you're watching the video version of this, you can actually see the spring in the body. Gotcha. And I'm compressing it. And if you're listening to the audio version, you can hear this. Really? 
Yeah, really. I, that happened. Okay. <laughs> so the COP3 is spring loaded. What happens is when you line it up and the extractor star on the cylinder hits the center of the speed loader, the spring activates and it shoots the rounds into the chamber. There's other direct injection speed loaders that aren't spring loaded. They just, when they hit that star, they just release them and they drop in. So examples of that would be speed bees, uh, the comp twos and the comp ones from Safari land. Um, there's a couple others that are like that. Those work no matter what style of reload you use. Okay. If uh, also moon clips, because you just drop them straight in will work no matter what. Right. If you use a weak hand reload that I do, and you want to use twist knob speed loaders, such as your five-star loaders or your HKS loaders, you will either have to poke your index finger through the frame of the revolver like this to stabilize the cylinder, because those loaders work by twisting a knob. And if you don't do that, there's nothing to stop the cylinder from rotating. Oh. That's why if you absolutely are married to the twist style speed loaders, you have to, I recommend using either the Mitchell Eck or the stress fire reload because that reload I'm stabilizing the cylinder with my support hand right. as I hold it and I can twist in or yeah. push in or throw a moon clip or whatever. So um, it is worth noting that obviously the Mitchell Eck reload is called that because of Jerry uh, and uh, Michael Pogi, who's currently the best revolver shooter on the face wow. of the planet, also does a Mitchell X style reload. And he, this motherfucker, and I say that lovingly because I talked to him on the phone and we're sending him some guns and stuff. That man has a sub one second reload oh, online, which is. <laughs> I've seen him shoot. So fast. Yeah, I've seen him shoot. I've taken photos of him shoot at Nationals uh, recently this year, or last year, whatever. Um, I was going to ask you because I saw Rich Wolf's belt and we've talked about his. His belt. He like made homemade because it has moon clips, but it's just like the stick center. Mm -hmm. And he's a hand constructor this years ago. It's the only belt he's like ever had. It works. It's awesome. For people that don't know how to build those things, he's like, what sort of retention belt mag? Oh, Lord. So, right. Like, where do you even find that type of gear? So, and the sad thing is one of the companies that I used to use very exclusively went out of business, which uh -huh. makes me upset. So if you're looking for gear for IDPA, uh, luckily there's still plenty of that around. So CompTAC makes speed loader pouches and holsters, which is what I use now for my IDPA gear for the stuff that you would need. If you're looking for USPSA gear, there's, there is still stuff out there. Um, I want to say, do, do. So there used to be a company called, uh, North mountain machining for wheel guns and that those guys, those guys were, those were the guys and they went out of business. So, but now you can get a, um, thankfully double alpha makes a magnetic moon clip holder. So if you want to do USPSA, first off, if you want to do USPSA, you need to get a gun that takes moon clips and it should really be a nine mil. So you're looking at either the 929 or the Ruger super GP 100, right? And the and 929 is, just, is Smith and Wesson. Yes. Yeah, because well, I'm going to ask you about guns in a second, but keep going. Yep. Okay, so luckily Double Alpha makes a magnetic moon clip holder pouch. Um, and, of course, I'm on Shooter's Connection and they're out of stock, so good luck. <laughs> uh, hang on, let's look at competition moon clip really? holders. Really? So you yeah. should really be Joe Rogan soon in the background that like, Googled all this shit. Yeah, I need I need a Jamie That's, to you need that job. here. Here we go. You so are. we have the <laughs> we have the Revolution Act, uh, Revolution Rack from Midwest Competition Works. So they have one that holds a bunch of moon clips too. So good for them for making <laughs> that. Yeah. Okay. So Midwest Competition Works would be a place to get it. Uh, and then you can get a ghost holster that works. You need a bunch of other ancillary support gear, like you need a mooner and a demooner. Um, that's the other thing. And again, it's not that I don't like shooting USPSA revolver. It's that the cost of entry is actually right. it's it's actually higher for yeah. revolver division than it is for production division. Oh, for sure, it's, for it's higher for revolver division than it is for any of the other low cap divisions. And you know, you're and then people are like, or I could just buy a Glock seventeen MOS and three magazines and shoot carry optics. And for like, sure, or you could do that for sure. Um, Okay, so you mentioned the holsters. What I was going to ask about is the guns. Obviously, I'm familiar with the 929, um, but you can name like top three, five guns or whatever. For so for revolver. USPSA, your your top guns are going to be the Smith and Wesson 929s, and then 
your older 627s, that's going to be an eight shot 38 special, or I have one that's a 38 super because that's how big of a gun hipster I am. Uh, no joke. When I was talking to Mike on the phone, he was like, whatever you want for it. Just if you ever don't want it anymore, name a price, I'll buy it off. you." <laughs> and I was like, no. <laughs> um, so you're old. So you're going to have your number one and number two are going to be 929s and Smith and Wesson 627s because those are eight shot moon clip guns. You've got guys out there campaigning the Ruger Super GP100 in nine mil and also in uh, 357 slash 38 special. Um, and then that's it. Those are your top guns. Anybody else that's using anything else is. <laughs> is insane is wrong no <laughs> no it's not that they're wrong it's that those are the only guns that are competitive For at sure. this point in uspsa right yeah because when they changed the rules to allow eight shot minor power factor all of the six shooters went away that was yeah. it. that was the end of six shoot yeah, of six shots because it's not like uh single stack where you you can shoot major and have eight in the gun and you've still got enough to finish most sure. arrays right if yeah. i'm shooting major and i only have six in a gun you know what it is it's standing reload time yeah i know i watched like that. well this is terrible not fun yeah yeah um okay so that's interesting so anything else that you want to mention about revolver uh, divisions in any of the sports, i IDPA, USPSA, anything that we did Sure, know. I'll talk about i for like the two people that care. So <laughs> i is, I like, I I would love for there to be more i matches, um, but it's a very small sport. The closest i match to me is like a three and a half hour drive, which bums me out. So i has the most revolver divisions, right? So they have an open division, which means dots, compensators like i'm built my 627 38 super is going to be an icor open gun it's got a compensator it's going to have an sro on it it's going to be litty um so they have that sort of open division they have limited division which is basically now the same as uspsa where it's eight shot guns uh then they have classic division which is what i shoot which is speed loaders six shot guns uh you know like your traditional when most people think of a revolver that's what they think of yeah right? yeah and then they have a limited six division as well, which is if you have a moon, a six shot moon clip gun, you can shoot that in limited six. Um, those guns are, that's for a lot of the guys who used to shoot like your 625s, your 45 ACP six shooters in USPSA oh, back in the day. Gross. And now those guns aren't competitive anymore. Those guys are savages um, <laughs> and they're all 70. So <laughs> so what what guns are you looking at in i like outside of? Just the two, you know. So in i core yeah, is i core because you have such a broad scope of divisions, you're obviously going to have your 929s or 627s, but sure. you're going to have guys running, you know, GP100s, you know, old K-frames, uh, like anything. They even have like a, a snub division where you have to shoot like a sub three inch gun and stuff like that. So wow. all kinds of stuff you'll see. And then you'll see in IDPA, which is IDPA, you will see predominantly you're going to see what people think of when they think of like a service gun, right? You're going to see predominantly four inch, three, uh, six shot, 38 special or 357 mags, like this Taurus model 82, you know, you'll see stuff, a lot of stuff like this in IDPA. You will still see a few guys running like your 45 ACP, uh, six shot moon clip guns or your, uh, 40 Smith and Wesson six shot moon clip guns in IDPA, but those aren't as competitive as anymore because they have a higher recoil penalty versus yeah. the 38s. No joke, the power factor for 38 special in IDPA and revolver is 105. What? That's nothing. It's so that factory ammo can make the power factor. Yeah, but that's the so 38 most... special can be a whole lot more expensive though, too. Yeah, oh yeah, I pay like 35 bucks a box for my ammo. That's so disgusting. that's fine. Perfect. Gross. gross. Yeah. When I, when I pay for ammo, I try to I was to about to say that. that as well. <laughs> yeah. If I have to pay for ammo, I mean. Uh, uh. Um. Oh God, I was gonna ask about that. Oh, okay. So, what do most people do to modify their revolvers, like springs, you know, trigger weight, or do they? You know, yeah, most people, most people will modify their revolvers. Um, and it's a, it kind of depends on that person's shooting style. Yeah. to how they want it so the number one thing that i'm concerned with with a revolver trigger is i want it to pull smoothly i don't want it to stack up at the end of the pull so what will happen with a lot of guns is you'll start your trigger pull and it'll start and you'll get right back here at kind of the last you know uh 
three eighths of the pull and it'll start to stack up and get really heavy. And I want to eliminate as much of that as possible. So in this gun, it doesn't really stack up at the end. It just rolls straight through. Um, that's more important to me than trigger pull weight is a lack of stacking. Uh, some guys just want it to make it as light as possible. <laughs> and uh, other guys want it to reset quickly. So Jerry was notorious for putting heavier reset springs into his gun so that it would reset even faster so he <laughs> couldn't outrun the trigger. Yep. Um, but the other thing that we have to remember with revolvers is because – so this is entirely a mechanical system, right? I'm not I'm – not, the amount of trigger pull weight that I have – also directly affects how much weight is going onto the firing pin, which is going then to ignite the primer, right? So yeah. if I go too light on this trigger pull, all of a sudden I'm in a match and I'm like, oh, I'm so cool. Bang, 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 bang. Click. No shots, yeah. And I get a click and then I got to go bang, bang, click, 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 until I get back around to it. And hopefully I get it with that second uh, hammer strike. And then if I don't, I'm really effed. Right. So you have to be able to balance reliable ignition with getting the right trigger weight in there. And that's why, you know, you have things like the apex kit, which has an extended firing pin in it. I have that in all of my Smith and Wessons have the apex uh, revolver kits in them because it's a really efficient way to get a good trigger out of the gun for my Rugers. I put uh, Wilson combat springs and all of those for my Tauruses. I change one spring. Actually, I, here's a fun fact. And this is not me throwing shade. So I've been shooting revolvers for a fairly long time. I have like a quarter million rounds down range on revolvers. Tauruses, the Tauruses that I have now in 20, the year of our Lord, 2023, um, have required the least action work of any guns I have ever owned. Hmm. So on my Rugers, I would normally have to change the mainspring, the trigger return spring, and do some like with like an emery cloth or something like that. Yeah. Uh, with my Smith & Wessons, I would usually have to change – I have to change many components. I would have to change the mainspring. I would probably change the strain screw. I would have to change the friggin' – uh, firing pin, the firing pin spring, the rebound slide spring, just rip the whole gun apart and put all kinds of new shit in there. With my Tauruses, I change one spring. Hmm. I change the main spring. Okay. And that's it. And I end up with all of my guns have trigger pulls that are under 10 pounds. I get reliable ignition with domestic manufactured primers. All right. I'm not out here shooting, you know, hard as fuck Aguila primers or whatever out of here. Um, and really good trigger pulls. Uh, yeah. Part of that is due to the way the gun's designed, but there's no rebound slide to drag on the inside of the frame. Um, but yeah, uh, I get really good. I've got really good triggers in all these guns with very minimal work, which is nice because it used to be when I would get a new gun in, the first thing I do is I'd rip it apart and, you know, for sure, fur around with the insides for hours. Uh, but these are pretty great. I'm, pretty pleased with that yeah uh, also if people you you did mention that i work for taurus right so like i'm paid by taurus right. i don't i don't want people to like the like are these good guns yeah absolutely yeah. but i am back to being a freelancer ethics is really important guys if you get paid by a company or you do stuff for free you should probably disclose yeah. that yeah yeah, I mean, but most of the people that I work with, and I'm sure you are the same, were companies that like you already use by our, you know, their mm -hmm. products. So, like a lot of them, like, hey, disclaimer, I'm sponsored by them now, but I wasn't beforehand, and I still use their stuff, and still would without that, you know. Yeah. Um. No, like I want to ask about how you got the job, at Taurus. Like, you know, remember you said military kind of came back up in 2015, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, when did you? I know your reserves now, but. How did you find Taurus job? How did that come about? And when did so you So I was, you know, I, I've, I've been, uh, I had been freelancing for ages and ages. And while I was freelance, so, and I known uh, Brett, who's our president at Taurus USA back from, back from the Walther days, right? And uh, I did, and Brett invited me out to a conference that they held out at Taurus in 2020 to consult on a project that would eventually become the executive grade 856, which we launched last year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the big things from that project was 
they said, you know, they asked us, the consultants, what we thought we, they should make in a gun. And we told them, and then they did it, which is unusual in this industry <laughs> for them to just be like, oh, okay, here's the thing you said we should make. And we're like, right. what? What happened? You know, I feel faint. Um, <laughs> so that was, that was kind of like the first step. And then they hired Cody, uh, who also came from Walther. And for the record, Taurus is like the, like the lost boys of Walther, basically, at this point. Um, I'm kidding. But they hired Cody, who also came from Walther. And I didn't know Cody uh, personally, but we had a ton of mutual connections through the self-defense training industry. So we've trained under a lot of the same people. And I immediately called those because so I called those people and was like, hey, uh, what, you know, what's up with this Cody guy? And what I didn't know was Cody had also called those people and was like, I need a revolver guy to help me with these lines. Who should I talk to? And they're like, oh, talk to Caleb. So we had like that mutual connection. So we started talking. Uh, that turned into a job offer, which I was like, yes, I would like a steady paycheck. <laughs> and here we are. Yeah. Um, you know, cause that is the, that is the one thing about freelancing that is not great is if you're not looking for work, you probably, if you're not actively writing something for money, you should probably be looking for somebody to give you money. And if you're not doing either of those things, you should be sending invoices. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Yep. Cool. Okay. So, um, shot show. So you went to back to shot show this year with Taurus and you hadn't been since 2018, 2019. So my last shot show uh, was 2019. I was there as a rep for Lone Wolf, who was I was contracting with at the time. Um, Lone Wolf has since like gone through like an ownership change, and they're making great products. Uh, they do at this the time. for the HKs, right? What Lone Wolf, like the the stuff that does HKs, like triggers or no, mm, no, mostly you know. Glock stuff. Like that was what they got really. That was what they really got known for. I could was be thinking of a different brand as well, but uh, ooh, that's the wrong website, Caleb. Okay. <laughs> Lone we talk in wolf. third person yeah a little bit uh here we go yeah so lone wolf distributors uh i was working for them in 19 and then i was gone so i was in the middle east uh you know just chasing camels around then i well then there was no shot show in 2021 i forgot about that then in 2022, at the time I was working for Athlon Outdoors, I was the editor for TacticalLife.com, and they were like, "Yeah, you don't need to go. We've got the show covered." And I was like, "You were happy about it." Yeah. I was, I was, I was happy. I still got COVID. I got COVID at home. Yeah. So I love Shot Show. So what were? I mean, okay, we we've heard all the rumblings too, where it's like, okay, Shot Show is no longer the place to be. You know, there's a lot of manufacturers that have pulled out of Shot Show and don't find value in it. Correct. I have the same sentiments for those watching. I won't repeat what that was visually. Um, <laughs> listening. Anyways, I was I, rolling dice. Yeah, sure. Okay, for yeah, for Vegas, I got that. Um, we're not going to get there. So, Caleb, um, why is Shot Show still valuable for people that are in the industry and? You know, what were your sentiments, I think, overall attending this year? Well, so let's talk about like the whole like SHOT Show is not relevant anymore. It's super cool to say that right now. That's sort of like the like. Especially by know, people that have never gone, will never go and cannot get in. Oh, did right. you say that out loud? Or by people whose companies have intentionally pulled out of the show and they have a narrative that right. they need to push. Right. You know, I think SHOT Show will always. Do I think that SHOT Show will always be like a must attend show. No, I don't. I don't think it's actually ever been a must attend show, but shot show will always be relevant and it will be especially be relevant for brands that are looking to eat, to do something with their reputation in one way or another. Right. Yeah. So if you're like a small to medium sized brand shot show is where you can go to get discovered. The number of times as a freelancer where I would be wondering, you know, through the sex dungeon downstairs and like find something interesting and be like, this is really cool. Like this is a thoughtful, oh innovative God. product. Yeah. And then, you know, fast forward three years later, those guys are on the main floor. Main They're doing, floor. you know, a gajillion yeah. dollars. Like yeah, everybody, if I say Raven Concealment Systems, everybody knows who Raven Concealment Systems is, right? RCS used to be in like the back corner of the Sin Dungeon, like way away from everything. And, you know, things change. So yeah. Shaw will always be relevant. You know, if you're trying to get discovered, um, it will always be relevant for brands that are trying to like do something different with your reputation, their reputation. And I do want to point out, like, everyone is always like, oh, well, SIG doesn't go to Shot Show. Hang on. 
But what does Sig do right before? Sig oh, does go to SHOT Day. Show, but they don't go to the actual show. They yeah. have their own private event that is at the same place, same time, the same geographic place. Yeah. You know, they have their own private range day because they understand everyone is going to Are be there. there. So they still need to capitalize on the bot on the bodies that'll be there. So yeah, I don't think if they did that I, separately. I don't think they would have the attendance that they would want it to be because a lot of people there are on the company dime, their own dime for media, you know. I, yeah. yeah like well, I and being out companies there. do companies do writer days all the time, right? Yeah. Where, you know, we get a pack of gun riders together and we fly small. them out to Gunside or to wherever. Yeah. We yeah. do like 20 people tops, yeah. right? I've been to a gajillion of those. The number of people that SIG can get at that are in Vegas at that time is, you know, triple that. Mm -hmm. So, or no, triple, 20 times that, right? They Lost get 400 that, yeah, people. Triple. triple, 60 people were there. <laughs> <laughs> Good we, event, math, guys. Math is really hard. We wrote a million words, but we can't do 20 times. I, I had to use a calculator to do those million words. So ask, look, I shoot a revolver, all right? If I have to count past six, six at any given oh, time, I'm having a bad, bad day. Yes. Um, the shot show is relevant. Shot show is valuable. Yeah, absolutely. Shot show is um, relevant. And I, I think, think the show may shrink in size in the intervening sure. years, but for it's always going to be relevant, especially for, you know, your smaller mid tier brands. And then I do actually think that your high tier brands need to be there as well, because that's what lends the show that sort of cachet of, uh, glamour and seriousness right for sure yeah i mean i know you didn't get to leave your booth much but was there anything that intrigued you <laughs> about uh, 2023's get... new stuff online from a lot of companies what did i get to see that was new and cool you got to see um, a lot of your copycat guns i kept seeing you post about <laughs> this is yeah <laughs> I, I, I well i was right next to the sar arms booth so i saw the revolver that they're making and it, what about it their looked... cz you know that I, I didn't look at their cz and i'm not i'm, I'm not talking shit about uh sar because i I don't actually know if the gun shoots, but it really looks like somebody was like, we have a Smith and Wesson at home. And that's what they ended up with. Oh um, what did I see that was cool? Uh, I didn't even actually see the hollow sun that everybody was. Dude, like, I was the about thermal to say. Hollow sun that everybody was jacking While you're off thinking over. about it, the hollow sun thermal though, for the price though, that they're, what they're going to offer at it. It was like 1200, 1400, I think 26 was a higher level. For a thermal, for hunting, for simple shots like that is a game changer by far. Um, Genesis Arms, what they're doing with that open shotgun, I got to go down there and check that out. Of course, it's in the John Wick 4 movie, but for, for three gunners, they're going to try to work in our three gun market. We've been dying for, you know, reliable out of the box open shotgun and he's got that. Um, go, actually getting to ride those Rambo bikes was the highlight of my shot show. It was the coolest thing I've ever done. And I did it in 25 mile per hour winds in 30 degree weather, blowing sideways rain, and then added the going 30 miles per hour on the bike. So it was like all of this wind. It was the coolest thing ever. Um, but you know, I got to see the, the Rock Island 5.0. I thought that new gun was really nice. Um, well, that was interesting. Um, it was a phenomenal gun. That trigger is four pounds stock trigger, flat trigger. I mean, it's. The reset's insane. Like, there is no reset. It's beautiful. Um, I shot the new Oracle 2311. I'm sad to report I hated it, but hopefully, you know, the people that like it, like it. But anyways, there was a lot new this year. That that, oh, really I hope that Oracle 20... So, as an aside, I really hope that Oracle 2311 sells a gajillion units and they do great with it. Um, that is one of the ugliest guns I have ever seen. That gun is... That gun is like, that's that gun that, that's an ugly baby gun where no one wants to say that it's ugly because it's rude to tell someone their baby is I ugly, know. but that gun is fuck ugly. Oh, I hope I'll it sells though. I really do. I'll tell I you really, if your baby's really ugly, but I'm, I'm not. I, well, I know you will because you're rude <laughs> like that. Um, I don't know. I guess. Honest. Like, yeah. You know, rude, honest, same, honest. same. Rude people say that they're just being honest when they're trying to excuse being rude. <laughs> I did go play with the the POF nine mil lever action rifle. I, I completely forgot that about thing that. Thing was so funny. Like it was. Uh, cool. <laughs> let's see what what is new. Oh, and Real what? Avid came out with a skew. I'm again sponsored by them, but I love their stuff. I've used their tools forever. Their innovations and stuff that I can't even talk about coming are incredible. But they have like a a new like sled to go to be able to work on your stuff while you're gone. My AR-15 block, they've got just this little insert that goes on top for an AR-10. <laughs> Mind blowing. It's like a $5 thing. Um, there's just a lot of simplistic stuff that when they come out with this, your mind's blown. Cause you're like, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> but right. Um, I guess. <clears throat> okay. So the only thing that I'm really interested in from Shacha that isn't one of our new products <laughs> 
which we launched a ton of new products, including the Taurus Judge Executive Grade, the Toro Revolvers, the TX22 Compact uh, on the Rossi line. We launched two new revolvers. It was busy for me. Yeah. Um, I am really interested in the Beretta ADX Cheetah, the Optics Ready Railed Cheetah in 380 because okay. it's just Fair. right in that niche of really weird but yeah. also really functional and i'm like that was a cool gun i shot that the, at the beretta day it reminded me too of the the walther brought the p99 back where you hit the button on the side of the slide that decocks it, it it's pretty cool but um oh, did they yeah but the beretta shotgun so they did a tactical 12 gauge shotgun the a400 um, patrol dude it's it's badass i i even I believe that. ryan nelson helped me out he even ghost loaded an extra round i mag to- tube dump? You call it a tube dump? It's not a mag dump? You can call it, no, it's a magazine. It is a fixed tubular it's magazine. Tube, Jesus. I said tube dump. Um, that Don't gun. ever say tube, tube dump. Tube I did it again. <laughs> I For wish some reason, that makes me like have the ick in the back of my awesome. throat. I wish I had the footage, but I do not, so it's depressing. But anyways, um, that was a lot yeah, of fun. So I, I didn't get to shoot the A400 Patrol. Um, fun fact, all of the cool products that Beretta launched this year were originally thought of by one of my friends who now works at FN. Um, but... Are we the same I, person? Probably. I don't want to like put him on blast. I don't either. On, on Never mind. <laughs> but anyway. No. So, but like the A400 Patrol. Uh, yeah, okay, that looked cool. And But for me, the cool one that I'm really actually interested in is that uh, Cheetah ADX. Because I think that there's a, there's a space that we have ignored for a long time for sub caliber compact guns that don't suck to shoot. Right. Yeah. So we've made, you know, little ass three eighties that are like the size of, you know, they're, they're smaller than my phone that are a pain to shoot and aren't very accurate. And I'm like, I do think there's a market for a bigger gun, like a TX 22 compact, for example, that shoots a sub caliber cartridge in the self-defense space where people are willing to say, Hey, you know, I lack hand strength and I lack the time to, you know, spend and really master this, but I still want a reliable self-defense gun. You know, can I get a 380 that works? Can I get an uh 22 that works? It's going to be first and foremost reliable and secondly, park a bullet where I want it to go. Right. So I think the, the Beretta Cheetah ADX exists in that space, yeah. assuming it works and assuming they can actually get them to market. Cause yeah. uh, let's see if I can go buy one right now. Cause you know what I can do right now? I can go on grab They're not sponsored. They're just who I happen to use to buy my guns from the inter- on the internet. Ooh, you know what? No, I should say guns.com. Cause they actually, we work with guns.com. Hang on. So I go to guns.com. And I could buy a TX-22 Compact right now, right? Mm-hmm. But can I buy a Beretta Cheetah? Sure can't. <laughs> That's horrible. Sure Let's can't. See. Anyway. Nope. Cannot. Let's try, let's try grab a gun, who is not a sponsor, but I work, but I bought a ton of guns from Beretta 80X. That's too many X's. Well, wow. One X. Uh, no, I sure can't. Sure can't. Uh, let's try Beretta Cheetah just to see if they have it listed to that. <laughs> nope. Nope. Can't do it. Can't buy it. But I can buy a TX-22 Compact, guys. Just, you know. So if you're those looking for cool. a sub-caliber, those are cool. They are they, cool. Those, like, are... I never thought that I would be, like, excited about a Compact 22 long rifle, but I have two of them coming. So, I mean, I was, I got the, the competition one. I obviously, I did aftermarket parts because I thought it was fun, and it's the TK stuff, but paired with it. the Taurus runs period out of the box like runs but then i got a little into tk arm stuff then i got 22 suppressor so i'm gonna shoot that suppress when it finally gets out of jail that's one of my that is my yeah that's one of my favorite 22s there's two i don't want to you know it's hard to compete but no what's your other favorite 22 the volcourt then but like I just, oh well yeah I, but uh, that's like okay yeah, yeah i know i know so the price difference is huge as well guys so <laughs> Taurus yeah. budget um, that's the crazy thing about the tx22 but the <laughs> compact and the competition are like sub 400 dollars, so and so they run they run 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 i've had a lot of people shoot those um at the gun shops because i brought them up to play with suppressors and i've sent you the text messages where people are like oh this is incredible i'm like hi right. no. <laughs> like, yeah i know it's incredible um, 
and there's a lot of women that came to my event last year. I, I bought the TX-22 just for the gals day, like a week before got in. And there were people that went out and bought that gun after and they shoot and still challenge. It's the perfect little still challenge pistol. So, Oh yeah. You can literally go buy. So we sell one called the SCR steel challenge ready. It yep. comes with a compensator and a, it's a tandem cross compensator and a tandem cross extractor on it. And it's, four hundred and fifty dollars at retail and that's you can awesome. literally it comes with three sixteen round magazines that's it put a dot on it you're ready to go shoot seal challenge room fire yeah. division oh yeah yep so i love i love those guns and i i think tours come a long way i know a lot of a lot of people that have changed their minds the gx4 is phenomenal too that gun is really comfortable to shoot um it is and it's so tiny but it's so but it shoots like a midsize it reminds me a lot of the sds guns that are coming out the tesis um nine mil like pistols, handguns. I mean, they're around the same price, and those are turkey made, but they're four or five. I mean, bucks. those guns remind you of GX4, there you go. not the sure. other way around. There you Come go. On. And then Canic still, you know, superior. Well, I know it, that you have. We know that you love Canic for I some really reason. Do. I really do. They're fantastic guns. But anyways, what's what's not surprising, but it, I think more people need to shoot the guns is how incredible they are for the price, the value, and they they are comfortable. Um, and more gun manufacturers, I think, are listening to feedback and finally developing the guns that like people want. You know. Well, and the other thing too is we're also in the absolute golden era of like of handguns in yeah. terms of handgun reliability, right? If you told me, I'll say how uh, you know, if you told me ten years ago, two thousand and thirteen, that there was going to be a nine mil striker fired gun made in Turkey that would be reliable, accurate. It costs less than 400 bucks. I would have said, <laughs> I believe that it might be two of those things, but definitely not all three oh, of them. Yeah. And I mean, but it's the same, yeah. you know, if you'd said that to me about Taurus in 2013, that Taurus yeah. was going to have not one, but like three different nine mils in our lineup that are sub $400 at retail and they all run great and they're all accurate. I would be like, yeah, right. Taurus, really? Right. Okay. But here we are. It is the God dang golden age of nine millimeter handguns i think and that's where i continue to buy them because i teach and i'll have a lot of people that like want to learn how to carry or they want to have different options right or hand sizes but even the walter i just picked up the pdpf i have the pdp anyways there's just all of these guns that are just great price great value and you got to find what works for you right not one gun's gonna work for everybody but it's really nice to have options these days it is i mean you know it used to be i remember you know when it was basically like, hey, do you want a good, reliable 9 mil carry gun? Cool, get a Glock 19. Glock. A Glock. And then it was, get a Glock 19 or an MP. And yep. that was pretty much it. And now, you know, uh, and now if you want, like, you can get a Beretta APX, you can get a Glock 19, you can get an HK VP9, you can get, you know, a uh, Spin West and MP 2.0. <laughs> uh, I'm sure that there's like 62 others that I'm Not leaving named. off yeah. the list. You know, but there's so many options for reliable and reasonably priced nine mil carry guns these days. Yeah. I've never seen anything like it. Yeah. So um, the other topic I want to talk about, and we're totally switching gears here, was content creators, I think social media, and then like sponsored shooter type stuff. I know you and I get these fun emails. Oh, I want this free thing, or I'm entitled to this free thing, or I want this, or I deserve to be sponsored. Like you see it in here at all times too. So like for people listening. What should be the first thing that shooters should be focused on before they ever even ask a company, want to work with a company? Like, what should they be doing first in terms of work before they even approach a company? That's a loaded question um, because I have, I have, I have very, I obviously have very strong opinions about this because I've been, you know, I, I've been on both sides of it. I've been the guy asking for sponsorships, and I've been the guy deciding whether or not someone gets a sponsorship, and. So the first piece of advice I'm going to be to give is this, uh, which might not be what you thought I was going to say, but if you are a shooter, you love shooting, you love the shooting sports, you love going to club matches and area matches and all of that, uh, don't make your hobby your job. Just keep loving it. Just keep keep having fun. And then that way, when you hit a point in you know three to five years where you're burned out and you're tired of it and you don't want to do it anymore, you don't have a financial obligation to keep doing it. You can just say, "I'm going to go play fucking golf instead." So do that. Don't don't, don't make this golf. your don't well take up swimming or tennis, whatever. You know, pick up you get <laughs> I hate the golf. if you don't make your hobby your job. When you get tired of your hobby, you can just go do a new one, How and you, you haven't then. How come I made my hobby my job? How could I? Nobody, do that? How come I did that? 
Cause, cause we're not smart people. Like we're smart at what we do, but like when we're balancing work life decisions, we're like, no, I want to work all the time. That sounds great. So in all seriousness though, if you do decide that you want to, you know, pursue this as a career, pursue a financial interest in it, the most important thing that I think you can do is figure out where you can provide value for your brand. Right. So I, if I'm looking at, you know, you know, if I'm looking at a spot at sponsoring a new shooter, right. If somebody comes to me and says, Hey, you know, I'm so-and-so I do X, Y, Z, you know, I shoot this and that. The first thing I'm going to look at is, are you doing something where my customers are? Mm -hmm. Right. So like if you, for example, like if you're a three gun, you know, I'm going to use Taurus as an example. I would not sponsor a three gun shooter at Taurus right now because I don't make three guns. I don't even make two guns for that. Right. Like I make a pistol. Yeah. You know, that's great. You know, if I was like, Hey, I'm not going to throw shade, but (laughs) it's strange to me if I was a company that produced primarily handguns and I sponsored two, three gun shooters. I know. Um, that would be a confusing decision, uh, especially if I, especially if I was this company and I already sponsored one of the best handgun shooters on the right. planet, right. and then I sponsored some three gun shooters. Okay, but whatever, that's fine. That's fine. At least that company does make two guns of <laughs> two of the three guns. But anyway, um, that would be confusing. No, but like the big thing that you can do is figure out where you provide value and. That value doesn't necessarily mean you have to have a hundred thousand YouTube subscribers or ten, you know, twenty five thousand followers on Instagram. You could have seven thousand followers on Instagram, but if you have engaged followers, that provides value for that brand. Or if you are a, you know, if you are a, you know, someone who produces educational content, if you've got a skill set where you're good at talking to the camera, you know, like all of my sponsorships with the exception of one or two had a content creation piece in them because basically what I would pitch these people on is I will create content for you because that's what I'm good at. And in exchange for that, you will pay me money and you will also cover my match fees and things like that, or provide me with guns and that sort of stuff. So I was never a sponsored shooter because I was going to go out and, you know, dominate nationals Win. and do KCUCBO. I was a sponsored shooter because I could go to the match. I could use that, my sponsor's products in a, in this match. And then I could articulate in a form of content, why I used them, why I liked them and what was good about them. Right. Yeah. So that's kind of, I mean, that's always going to be my formula. If you cannot articulate to somebody why you are using this person's product. So if you roll up to a sponsor and you say, Hey, will you send me, you know, I'll use a gun as an example, a free gun. And they say yes. And then you use their gun. And then someone asks you why, and you can't answer that question. You have no why for them. You're not giving that uh, sponsor any value. Yeah. So you have to be able to provide value. If you don't know how you can provide value, then you need to go get a skill that will provide value, like writing, talking to the camera, <laughs> uh, yeah. you know, having, you know, if you have a hundred thousand Instagram followers, great, but I would caution you uh, against necessarily leaning too heavily on social media influence as we move forward in this time. Yep. <clears throat> Doesn't exist. So yeah. Uh, do you teach as well? I do. Uh, I actually have a class coming up. So I teach a revolver class for, I teach for a company called Citizens Defense Research. We have a number of instructors. We teach a number of different classes. I specifically teach a revolver class called, uh, I forget what it's called, uh, Fundamental Revolver Skills. Okay. So I definitely backronym this class, right? So what I wanted to call it was fucking revolver shooting. Um, and then I needed like FRS. I'm like, all right, a uh, fundamental revolver skills. So that's what it's called. Um, I have one coming up in uh, September in Culpeper, Virginia of this year. I usually only teach one or two a year because it's I'm, your schedule. I'm, busy. I'm a little busy, a little, a little busy. Yeah. Uh, fun story. I sent, for people who don't know, Kenzie and I are, are friends. We actually text on the a lot. And I sent her a screenshot of my travel schedule. It was like sometime last year. And you're like, congratulations on your move to Connecticut or to Charlotte. Because I had like 14 layovers in the Charlotte airport for all of these oh, yeah. trips. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, uh, yeah. So I have a class coming up in Culpeper, Virginia. You can go to the Citizens Defense Research website to find it and sign up for it. 
Uh, it'll be, it's two days. We shoot about 500 rounds. We do a lot of, we, we cover a lot from, you know, basic revolver maintenance, you know, all the way up to like shooting these things at a very high level. Uh, I enjoy teaching a lot. Um, but it is very time consuming. Yeah. Uh, to your point, I'm also still in the Air Force Reserves, which also is more t- consumes more of my time as 12 well. Twelve weekends a year, so now you're yeah. down to twelve week. Yep. Tw- yeah, I, I, I lose twelve weekends. I lose a couple of. I lose about a month for active duty every year, and then you know they'll be like, "Hey, can you come down on orders for the thing and the place?" And I'm like, "Sure, let's do it." Like, I will say this: it's awesome though. Last year, I got to fly to Denmark and compete in an international marksmanship con- uh, competition with like the national guards and reserves for like the Danish military, the there's a whole bunch of like European, like NATO countries there that had like their guard and reserve shooting teams out there. So I got to be part of that for the air force, which is pretty nice. cool. We did all right. According to the trophies sitting out of shot <laughs> that I have over here. So that's awesome. Um, what's your email for people that want to ask for the free gun after they listen? <laughs> I'm uh, just PR at usa.com. I'm still kidding. Uh, how do people find you on social media and follow your fan page and your Instagram? <laughs> oh my, yes. So you can find me on uh, Instagram at Radicaleb, R A D I C A E. So Jesus Christ, I just misspelled my own name. It's radical, but like radical with Caleb, with, all mashed yeah. in. So R A D I C A E. The word is a, so the, the term for that is a portmanteau. It's where you take two words and mash Jesus, them. Jesus, nerd. Jesus. So it's R A D I C A E. L E B. There we go. Rada Caleb on uh-huh. Instagram. You probably will have to type the whole thing in to find yep, me because I'm probably totally shadow banned. Shadow banned. And then Facebook, it's Top Shot. <laughs> it is not. It absolutely is not. No, on Facebook, it's uh, facebook.com slash Caleb Shooting. But if you search for Caleb Giddings, you'll find probably two results. One of them will be. I will my not personal... respond to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, one of them. No. One of them is my personal page, which <laughs> you can send me a friend request that I will not accept. Exactly. And the other one is my fan page, which you can follow. And I'm not saying that because I don't want to interact with God, with oh, yeah, people, yeah, yeah. but my, after some of the personal, after some of the life experiences I've had in this industry, I keep my personal Facebook wrapped up pretty tightly. Yeah. Um, and then you can also follow me on YouTube. Uh, I am, I think it's, I think my URL for that is you, hang on. Um, it's, uh, not quite hang on it's i'm i'm trying to remember like because they just did this thing on youtube where you have like handles now yes. so wow you boomer um also you can go to to, to look at <laughs> the yeah. new guns on taurus's website rossi's handguns website um and then heritage firearms which are really fun 22s um, I just did. A- oh, if you go, oh, it's Mr. If you just search for Mr. Revolver on YouTube, that's God. me. M I S T Mr. Revolver. That's not Mrs. M R S dot. No, not, not M R S. So no, definitely Caleb. Mr. Revolver. I identify as a man. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, oh God. Oh God. You know, all of that. Oh God. Oh God. Caleb, thanks for coming on. Thanks for explaining the reloading process and talking about revolvers and stuff. I think that's very educational because nobody. Uh, ever probably if I can ever get Pogi on would be able to explain this. <laughs> yeah. If you get him on hit well and he reloads completely different than it. He yeah. used like an index finger swipe and like the when I said there's a million ways to skin a cat, it's because it a lot. there's a lot of like little subtle variations that you can get into yep. with this. Yeah. So thanks for coming on. I will see you in the Charlotte airport. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll we'll run into each other in an airport lounge again here in a couple right. of weeks. And every time I'm in your area you'll be out of town. Um <laughs> Yeah, of course. It's just yeah, so that's annoying. that's how it is. Every time I have an event that I want you at, you're gone. So. I'm at a different event. Yeah, yeah. So okay. annoying. Welcome to the firearms industry, where you see your friends. You would think you would see your friends more often, but we're always at everybody well, else's events. But what's really sad too is that you see your firearms friends more than you see your own family in like 17 years. Like combined, you see them more in one year. I'm not going to talk about the last time I've seen you know like all of my brothers together. So no, yeah, years. Yeah. Oops. Yep. So. You know, whatever. It's fine. It's fine. We're all fine here. <laughs> awesome. All right, listeners. Thanks for tuning in. Stay tuned for next week's all new episode of the Red Club Podcast. Subscribe. Do all that jazzy stuff. But uh, go bother Caleb on Instagram for me and uh, make it fun. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Red Club Podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. Follow along on social media at Red Club or Three Gun Kenzie.